Today on Down Pepper Tree Lane, we're going to talk about the unspoken conspiracy of the 1980s. In the 1980s, record executives and MTV conspired to make a radical change, to foment a radical transition in the style and nature of pop culture itself. And in that process, they forced many established bands and artists to adapt to this new idea, this new concept called New Wave. New Wave started in the 1970s. And at first, it was considered a joke. It was first not taken seriously. But somehow, it was obvious that this was the trend of the future. Bands like Devo, the B-52s, the Ramones, Blondie, and many others showed that they had great commercial potential and that the times they were a change in. So there were many bands that felt made a natural transition into this. And there were some that were quite unfortunate train wrecks in the process. Today, we're gonna to talk about both. We're gonna talk about how it interpreted itself in rock and roll and how it interpreted itself in pop music. So let's begin. Let's start with Styx. So oh boy. Well, now Styx represents an interesting thing because certain rock and roll bands use the so-called progressive rock thing as their great umbrella, their great shield. And there were bands that were already on this tip and didn't, didn't do well with it at first. For example, Jethro Tull had already smelled the, smelled the coffee in the 70s and had put out a very strange album called, just enigmatically called A, the letter A, that had a big red letter A on it. And he alienated a lot of his core fans, with, whereas he was doing this very beautiful, instrumental, English folk-inspired music. Suddenly, it's this stark, angular, synthesized, you know, very instrumental kind of, with, with strange lyrics that didn't seem to make sense, things that forebode about the future. Styx, I think, picked up on that idea. Um, the, the lead singer of Styx, Dennis DeYoung, was always something of a visionary. And because he was a keyboard player as well as a singer, he had to champion the new technologies that were emerging in that the synthesizer was becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more viable and more and more reliable as a performance instrument than they had in the 1970s. So Dennis came up with a concept. He said, hey guys, Let's do a concept album. It's going to be called Kilroy Was Here. And it's about a man who is some kind of criminal, some kind of deviant in society, who donned the exoskeleton of a Japanese robot and pretended to be one in order to hide, in order to, to God only knows what he was trying to do. Sell it, records. Yes, well, probably. That's the, really ultimately the whole thing. And did the progressive rock community respond well to it? Well, Mr. Roboto, as it was known, was a fairly big hit. And it certainly is well known. Did the established core of Styx's audience like it? Some did, some didn't. It was pretty bad. <laughs> Let's just face it. it <laughs> Domo arigato. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So, <laughs> so, but unfortunately, because it was a big hit, it started the ball rolling in a bad and ugly way. And now suddenly, jump suits and new wave and synthesizers were not the, the exclusive domain of new wave bands anymore. Now, progressive rock, established progressive rock bands and other types of bands were now donning this, this look and this sound. And the, the train kept a rolling. All right. How about Steve Miller Band? Well, Steve Miller it was a little different. He stayed true to his vision. He still wrote the same sorts of songs 
he was already writing. But, you know, to be fair, Steve Miller in the mid-70s was something of a synth pioneer himself, even though he was a guitar player. You know, uh, Fly Like an Eagle has a very interesting use of, of sequencing in it, which and but it was slow and it was psychedelic. It was it still stayed true to his psychedelic roots. It wasn't trying to be new wave or weird or anything like that. But um, when he got to the 80s, he did a song called Abracadabra. That was a video they did. It was a big hit. Um, it just was a different sound, a smoother, more compressed guitar sound, less distorted, less less Woodstocky sounding. It was just a very tight, simple thing, and you know, it was a good hit. It was a good. It was a good transition. That was a fairly smooth transition. Um, although he really didn't keep up with that, he kind of yeah. vacillated back and forth stylistically after that. But um, that was a pretty good example of that transition. That's true. Okay, how about the band? Yes. Yes was a very interesting story in that whole program because Yes was an example of a new wave band and an established hardcore keyboard progressive band completely merging. Because at that point when the 80s, Yes had almost broken up. As a matter of fact, Yes had actually recorded a typical fairies and and sword and sorcery kind of album very you know tolkien-esque fairy tale album that was typical of their 70s work and it and it just stayed in the can it never got released because the record executives and mtv felt it was just anachronistic it was just anachronistic it was just not contemporary with the times so the band kind of broke up um john anderson their well-known lead singer left uh, Rick Wakeman, their incredible wunderkind keyboard player, went on to continue his own solo career, which many of those works could almost be considered new wave. Um, that's also Patrick Moraz, another great keyboard they player that played with them from Switzerland. He left too. So they had to rethink the band. They got a hold of Trevor Rabin, a very, very talented and genius guitar player from uh, South Africa was brought in to fill in uh, Steve Howe's departure. Um, but what's most interesting is that basically what happened is the band, The Buggles, that's new wave band, The Buggles, you know, video kill the radio star, which was MTV's first video, uh, decided that they would simply dissolve themselves and become subsumed under the rainbow of yes, under, under, under rainbow. Well, you could say it that way, <laughs> under the rainbow umbrella of yes. And uh, so Trevor, Ray, uh, Trevor Horn, rather, who was their singer, became their lead singer. And Jeff Downs became their keyboard player. And they adapted and assimilated very well. And the album Drama that they then released, they then released in the early 80s. And what, what year did Drama come out? Like 80. 80, yeah. 80 yeah. was it? Okay. Uh, actually had songs that they had recorded as the Buggles reworked to be yes songs. And they were quite, they were quite interesting interpretations of them. But once John Anderson saw what a success they had been, he just said, well, you're not going to record an album of, as called Yes without me singing it, people. You already did one and it was all right, but I'm Yes. I am the voice of Yes. So he came back and Yes retooled themselves as kind of an 80s sounding band. Their new sound was very keyboard oriented, very slick. Their lyrical content was a little darker, a little more urban. Um, yeah. So but look at the album cover that was so different in design. Absolutely. From all of the airy fairy mountains yeah. and rainbows. Roger Dean, was he the guy that did all those it covers? It was just yeah. 90215. Stark uh, gray cover with simple pr primary colors and a logo. And, and a, yeah, and the album had, an, had a number. It was a number. And a massive number one song yeah. called Owner of a Lonely Heart. Which is could be new wavy rock. I mean, yeah. they seem to do a fantastic job with that song. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yes, uh, they survived. They sure right. did. All right. Let's move on to Genesis. And please mention the song Abacab. Because well, I think, okay. <laughs> well, Genesis. Right. Genesis was, they made the transition pretty smoothly. However, 
it was another situation where their visionary uh, leader, Peter Gabriel, again, had already, just like in the case of Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, had already seen the writing on the wall. And he wanted, he left Genesis in the mid 70s to start his own thing. Now, the album, the solo album that Peter Gabriel did would not be what we would call new wave, but it definitely was a departure from the kind of music he was doing with Genesis. The songs were tighter, more cohesive, more a little more conceptual, but but in a not in a long winded flowing kind of way. But as he went on in his solo career, he started getting very experimental and very angular and very abstract. Um, Shock the monkey. Shock the monkey being a great example of that. And he'd cut his hair. He, right. he, he adopted the new wave look at around the same time that everybody else was. And a lot of people perhaps thought that he was jumping on the bandwagon, whether he really was consciously or not is yet to be determined. Um, but Genesis then, uh, with Peter Ga- um, excuse me, with Peter Gabriel gone and Phil Collins taking over the duties on lead vocals, continued on in the in the mold of the kind of you know sort of sorcery stuff that they were doing, a kind of conceptual, long-winded keyboard soloish stuff. But uh, put Duke. out only one or two albums like that, and then they decided it was time for them to explore a more keyboard-oriented sound. And one of their first forays into that was Abacab, which also was a video on MTV. Very punchy. Very punchy, um, very synth-driven. Um, not exactly new wave, but certainly you could tell that it, it had a bore a strong influence. Right? It makes you nervous. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Depends edge, on, how about edgy? Depends on what, what drugs you're on that day, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. All right, Kansas. Kansas. Kansas pretty much, Kansas went through changes. They went through personnel changes. Um, some of their visionary people actually went into Christian rock. So that left the rest of the core band and, and Kansas had already been one of those bands, kind of like sticks that had internal strife. They had a synthesizer progressive camp and they had a rock and roll camp and the rock and roll people kind of took over when the Christian people left. So um, basically they just kept on going. They pretty much, I think just did what the record executives told them to do. They did ballads. They did hard rocking songs with crisp guitar work. Um, they got a hold of some good people. Don't get me wrong. And Kansas's albums from that period are listenable. They're darn good. Vinyl confessions. But they're not the progressive rock no. thing that you signed up for when you originally started getting into Kansas. And um, you're not going to hear a Dust in the Wind or a no. you know Carry On My Wayward Son on any of those records. Not to say they're not good records. But they, they explored that kind of both ballads and power pop genre for a few records. And then as time has gone on, they've kind of slipped back into their original in original mold. Uh, that's how they are now again. But it's an interesting interesting adaptation to times and, cha- and tastes. I think Play the Game Tonight was their, a good their big hit. That's a good yeah. song. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Cheap Trick? <laughs> I don't know. Cheap Trick? They were already kind of... Cheap Trick really didn't have to do much. They right. pretty much were already... Uh, when we first... You know, the album that really broke Cheap Trick, strangely enough, was a live record called Live at Budokan. It came out, what What would you say, 78? 70, yeah, 79. 70, yeah. Something like that. And, you know, and we all freaked out on that album. We all loved it. And, and that album had appeal... Definitely to the rock people, the the poppy kind of teeny bopper girls like that record. But it kind of left a strain. They, there wasn't a clear direction after that. Dream Police? Dream Police was a big hit, too. That came out right after that. That was a studio album that came out after that. Um, it didn't quite have the co- conceptual cohesion that people thought it would. Um, there were a few very good songs on that record, and that was when pop music started to be and rock music started to become orchestrated. And part of the difference between '70s rock and '80s rock is that '80s rock had no shame about using studio musicians, string sections, orchestral passages, 
And I think that Dream Police is a great example of that transition into that bands just letting themselves be produced and not complaining about it and just letting it happen, doing some pretty good videos that would go along with them. The Dream Police video is all right. Um, they became a hit and miss at that point, I would right? say so, yeah. I think She's Tight's kind of a new wave song. Well, the problem is is that Cheap Trick was, was never a hard rock band. They were a power pop band. So they were really a sort of a vanguard of the new wave sound before that even that term even existed. So they're, they're a hard one to call. Yeah, and we will close with ELO. Well, ELO went through many changes. They, they were really, they basically it just survived the transition in and out of disco. Right. Uh, they, um, they kind of, after disco, they trimmed the band way down. They got rid of all the string players and, you know, everything and just trimmed the band down to a trio and basically just made it synthesizers, drums, vocals, and some guitar. And that's it. Hold on tight. And, uh, well, that was, I'm, that was the beginning of that. I'm talking about that album that had the one big MTV hit that they had, which was um, the one. Oh, what's that one? People are going to have to look it up. I forgot. It's the yeah. one where he's complaining about the girl traveling. It was, it, the whole album was a breakup album, and it was about uh, his this girl that he was in love with. Oh, Calling America. I'm sorry. Okay, Calling America. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, the whole thing was very tragic. It was a concept album, but it was a kind of a bummer. And it was very sparse, very minimal. I The ELO survived the 80s, but weren't really a huge part of its sound. All right. That ends the rock segment of New Wave. Thank Stay you, tuned. Mike G. All right.